Uh, the original title for my talk um, was uh, sort of an engineering in-joke. I um, used the convolution operator between COVID-19 COVID and COTS at exas exascale, and I thought there might be a way of transforming the, problem, the situation into understanding um, what impact COVID-19 has had on the development of computers at exascale. Um, the reason, what the motivation really was that uh, everywhere else in society we were hearing about supply chain issues. Even in my business there were supply chain issues. Was there a supply chain issue uh, in building exascale computers or were there other aspects that we'd, we'd find interesting? Anyway, in the event I, I uh, decided not to use that convolution operator and just use the simple English AND. So, um, who am I? So what I'm going to give you now is a te reo Māori pepiha. And Māori, what does Māori mean? In the Māori language, Māori means normal. So if you're Māori, you're normal. Anyone else who comes to this country is not necessarily normal. So like Nicholas, <laughs> it's not necessarily normal. So here's my, pe here's my pepiha. A pepiha is an introduction to established connection. I will read the Māori and you'll be able to follow alongside in English. No mai hare mai, ko Duncan Hall toku ingoa, ke te whanganui atara e noho ana ahau, ko manatu aurere te wahi tari. Just an aside there, manatu aurere means ministry of flying around the world. Ko kaihanga punaha Roro hiko toko ropo mahi. Ko te mahi kai wetapanga nayo fai mana tako mahi. I'm a simple engineer. <laughs> no rero kia ora tato katoa. So greetings everyone. This is my outline for the next 15 minutes now. So I'm going to first of all talk a little bit about COVID-19 um, from the perspective not necessarily of exascale or high performance computing. When COVID, COVID came along shortly after uh, multi-core world number nine in 2020, we suddenly realized in lots of parts of our Western society how reliant we'd become on digital services. And one of the early um, sharp points was when Microsoft Teams had an outage. This is a map of the world. Notice of, of the impact of that out outage. Notice something. New Zealand is missed off the map. It's so common to see a map of the world without this little country down the bottom of the world being on it. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, our internet traffic demand grew enormously and it prompted a rapid expansion of the supply capacity. In March, there was news that broadband traffic hits new, a new record and gets closer to ceiling, and so it was rapidly increased from New Zealand to the rest of the world. Now, I'll just point out to you, this chap here is, he's now Sir, Sir Dr. Um, Ashley Bloomfield. And he, his role in New Zealand was very similar to that of Anthony Fauci in the United States. I happen to know of the name Anthony Fauci, uh, sitting on my bookshelf at home, uh, Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. No, I'm not a doctor, but the last name, name of the editors of that uh, two-volume work is Anthony Fauci. So he had his credentials. So does uh, Ashley Bloomfield in the medical world. Ashley Bloomfield became a, a, an internet, a, a media sensation. Um, you could buy T-shirts with his face on it. You could buy tea towels. You could buy mugs. A lady in uh, Hamilton even had him tattooed on her leg. So uh, there was a completely different response in New Zealand to many other parts of the world. We listened to evidence-based um, advice. We listened to COVID um, modeling uh, experts. And um, New Zealand's a small place. It really is. This morning, I, came, I went into work before I came to this conference. Who should be sitting at the desk next to my desk? But I took this photograph this morning. As you can tell, I've got the same shirt on. And, and what's more, he was using my cup. <laughs> 
So COVID-19 has had a major impact. Um, we've, virtual meetings have become familiar. I'm surprised we're not running some part of this meeting as a hybrid meeting because they're now routine. Um, and we've, of course, banded together as a community. This was a, an article from June of 2020, and that's Satoshi um, talking about banding together the high-performance computing to uh, defeat this common enemy we had. Another thing happened in 2020. The world became much more familiar with graphs. If there's one graph I'd like you to remember from this talk, it's this next one. Okay, so of course with all graphs, you, being a simple engineer, I like, much prefer straight lines than curves. I mean, I actually quite like curves, some curves, anyway. Um, so what you do is you put them on a log, log axis. This is an example, you can, by the way, my talk is already uploaded onto the web. So if you want to follow along, it's on my uh, ResearchGate site. Um, so this is a log, log plot of, um, total deaths on the x-axis versus confirmed cases on the y-axis. Of course, you can't have more than total deaths being more than confirmed cases, so there's a boundary down the bottom left here, and um, so that's 100% mortality. And what's the scary thing as time was going on that uh, some of these lines were converging on, you know, something closer to greater than 10% mortality. And notice what happened to the USA. Now, the chap who was drawing these charts up gave up in mid-2020, not because it was too much information, but because the raw data was suspect. I mean, who, how, do you, how do you prove that somebody died of COVID and not some other comorbidity? Um, how did New Zealand fare? Well, this is the plots for small countries, and there's New Zealand way down the bottom. How did this happen? How did New, Ze New Zealand do so well? They listened to the experts and followed their advice, heeded their advice. So um, just as a sort of backcasting exercise, um, welcome to New Zealand. New Zealand, um, here's the excess mortality during this last three years. This is not COVID, this is all deaths compared to what a forecast would, you know, seasonally adjusted forecast. So the United States, for example, has had something like 15, uh, this is a cumulative number, since the beginning of 2020, the United States has had 15% more deaths than it would have been expected based on prior forecasts. 15%. The United Kingdom's had something like 10%. Australia's climbing up towards 5%. Taiwan is climbing up towards 5%. Japan, what, what is New Zealand? Any guesses? What does New Zealand look like? It's negative. We have had fewer deaths since the beginning of COVID than would have been forecast, otherwise forecast. That's because we're taking better care of ourselves. Fewer pub fights, less motor car accidents. Ah, New Zealand. Why is it not on the map? <laughs> so let's, let's go and look at the exascale. So um, last um, multi-core world that I spoke at, I gave a whole lot of graphs about our progress towards exascale. I'm going to do the same thing again, but I'm going to, again, outline my constraints, I think, and, and an observation. The top 500 data, the one thing I want to point out here is that the data set is worth order of magnitude a billion dollars. The data that's in the top 500 published on the web, if you do the calculations, because there are now 30,000 data points, it's a worth of the order of a billion dollars to have got that data, that order, anyway. So, top 500 Oh, I've gone backwards. Top 500. So, what's an exa? Anything. How big is an exa? If you took all the stars in our Milky Way, there's only 300 billion of them, you'd need 3 million Milky Ways to make an exa number of stars. 3 million Milky Ways. Well, by some estimates, there are only 10 exa grains of sand on the world. So, it's a really big number. On the uh, Top 500 website, they have these very simple uh, semi-log graphs that show exponential growth. The top one is, by the way, a completely fictional uh, chart. That's just all 500 machines added together. The next one down is number one, and the one down the bottom is number 500. But you see, there's, they're sort of, sort of a bit linear, but no, they're not really. Let's, ha let's have a look at the structure of the last few years. This, by the way, is the most recent graph on the top 500 website. So. You can do a piecewise linear approximation or interpolation of what's going on. 
and you see that there was a period of time, uh, and sorry, I'll just go back to that, that's number one, okay? So we've got up to the year 2020 here, and then from 2020, and red from 2020 to 2022 inclusive. So something happened between this point in time and this point in time, it sort of flattened off, and then it got steeper again for number one on top 500. What about the um, number 10? What about number 100? What about number 250? Well, a similar sort of thing, it flattened off. I think, here we go. So something happened in the sort of 2014 time frame. Growth flattened off, and then they, uh, around about 2020, they sped up again, but look at this. The top end went back to more or less the same growth as prior, but the bottom end of the top 500 are much less. They're growing far less quickly than the top end. So there's a bigger and bigger differential between the top machines and the also rands, or actually what I call the, the exascale for the rest of us, the commercial off the shelf systems. They are growing, but by no means at the rate that the top end systems are. So a couple of observations. The growth for all ranks have reduced since 2014. Lower ranked machines have had lower growth rates since 2017. Second enhancement to the, what, the information that's available on the top 500 site. This is uh, a plot on a, on a logarithmic scale of the number one through to number 500 for November 2022. This is the speed, right? Well, that's kind of interesting, but it's been repeated for the last 30 years. Now, by the way, when you th do the sums, there are 30,000 data points on this Excel chart. I think I've broken my record. So that, that profile has um, marched on in time but um, what I th thought about was, take number one some time ago, Wh how long did it take for say number 10 or number 100 to become uh, equivalently fast as number one was? Take number one and year n, how many years into the future does number 10 or number 100 get to that speed? So I've worked that out and by the way, on my ResearchGate site, you can, I've, I've left the Excel um, spreadsheet with all of this calculation available for anyone to look at. So it turns out, um, so this is from number one to number 10, uh, looking at the, you know, a few years of information, it looks like it'd be about two to four years, um, so that number 10 catches up to number one, but no, but no. Only for uh, systems up to the petaflops range, more recent systems, it's taking more like seven to eight or nine years for number 10 to catch up with number one. This is a pattern that's reproduced across um, lots of other dimensions. So from number one to, to number 100, the time scale looks to be increasing. You know, it's up towards 10 years. From number one to number 250, again, up to 10 years. From number one to 500, again, as you'd expect, a, a longer time period. What about from number 10? So not the very top machine, but number 10 to 100. Well, similarly, the time it takes for a COTS machine to be available uh, at, at what was number 10 is order of, no, and growing, order of six to seven years or more. Number 10 to number 250, number 10 to 500, so similar patterns. So time for commercial off-the-shelf systems at roughly petaflops is still seven years after the, number, you know, the top, top machines have reached that scale. So um, what about the efficiency, the, the energy efficiency of these machines? This is the green 500. This is the number one machine in that list over time. Again, I've enhanced the um, plot by doing a piecewise linear interpolation. It's interesting. So um, this time period, again, from 20, well, 2016, 17, I guess, through to about 2020, there was a flat point. There didn't seem to be any improvement in efficiency, energy efficiency of these top end machines. Again, um, the top machines recovered a bit from 2020 onwards, but the middle of the road run ones, um, much slower growth. So after four years of stasis from 2016, the efficiency imp efficiencies improved, but the lower ranked machines had lower gains. So COTS machines are coming along. Uh, one of the issues around the green 500 is that, that I don't, we're not getting the information for all 500 machines uh, in terms of energy efficiency, so it's dropped down to around about a, a green 200. 
And, it, and how long does it take for a, um, say, a, a green, um, green 500 number 10 to get to what was one? Well, it looks off this plot anywhere up to sort of two, three years. Um, but when you get to, um, so that, that there is for um, you know, something of the order of gigaflops to petaflops, but when you're looking at gig, the gigaflops per watt, the years to cost from number one to number, number 100, it's an increasing function as time moves on. So it's getting harder and harder, well, it appears to be getting harder and harder to build machines for commercial purposes that run at the efficiencies of the top end um, top, top end efficient machines, large machines in the world, and from 10 to 100 and so forth. So gigaflops per watt, COTS efficiencies continue to be challenging. What about COVID-19's influence on the lead time to COTS at Exascale? That was my question, and that was where I had a hypothesis that the supply chain was going to impact on getting to Exascale. Well, um, what I've done here is to formulate the problem in a linear programming context. So linear programming is you uh, attempt to m either maximise or minimise a function subject to certain constraints and subject to, who can tell me, the usual non-negativity constraints, right? So that's what linear programming is about. So in this case we have efficiency along the y-axis and that's a measure of technology. We have power consumption in kilowatts along the x-axis, that's a measure of operating cost how many joules you're dissipating per second. So one of the barriers here is, um, it was commonly talked about, we wanted to have a machine, exascale machine running at less than 20 megawatts, so that's where that red line is. And, we, and for it to be exascale, the two have to multiply together, so megaflops per watt times watts equals some power of megaflops, so we want to be in this triangle up here for an exascale machine. You with me so far? That's where we're heading, in that triangle in there. So, what's the most recent data look like? Well, that's the scatter plot of the top 500 from November last year, and Oak Ridge National Lab's Frontier machine is just outside that triangle because it consumes, according to the measure, slightly over 20 megawatts. But it, it is slightly over one exascale, one, one exaflop. Interesting. Well, what happened in, what's happened since 2007 when the power efficiencies were, was the metric was um, put in place. So we don't have any information prior to that. What's happened since then? So let's say look at number one. Here's the journey of number one, the top machine in the top 500 over the last 15 years. So that's the trajectory it followed to get to where uh, Frontier is now. Well, what about number 10? Here's number 10. What about number 100? Here's 100. What about number 250? way down the pecking list, but you know, it's almost appro approaching a commercial off-the-shelf machine. There's still a long, long way to go for these COTS machines. You look, at that, look at that distance that's traversed there, there's equal, at least that same distance into the future before number 250 is going to be exascale. So we're talking quite a long time. So there's another 15 plus years for COTS at exascale, is my assertion. Um, if you if you interpret COTS as being computing for the rest of us, because these top-end machines are really arms race machines. They are incredibly complex, expensive uh, artifacts of electrical engineering, just amazing, and software engineering. Um, one thing, uh, an observation from myself as a simple engineer, I'm glad that, uh, Nicholas introduced me as such, the energy costs, or if you like, carbon footprint of Exascale are simply eye-watering. I mentioned 21 megawatts for Frontier. That's just the consumption of the box itself. Typically, it for every watt the box dissipates, you have to spend another watt to get it out of the, out of the building and to, the, uh, to heat up the rest of the world. So here's uh, off a presentation from one of the people involved in building this... Um, Frontier Machine, which by the way was built by an old employer. I was once employed by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So here's the slide and you can see some you know, heating, well, not heating, cooling, ventilating, air conditioning kit. And the man, the, the presenter says this is one of the hard parts. I said, oh, very well building uh, boxes with um, cards in them, you've got to cool them. So there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of cooling and how much does a 20 megawatt machine really consume? 
Well, as I said, for every watt you have to dissipate, you're going to use another watt to get it out of the building. So about a 40 megawatt load. That's in New Zealand terms about $80 million per year. In American terms, at least $40 million per year just running the box. Big money. And what about the carbon footprint? Well, speaking of carbon footprints and that little country that's not even on the map, here in New Zealand, over 80% of our energy uh, produced is actually from renewables, a mixture of hydro, geothermal, wind power, and increasingly solar. So we are well placed to run green computing should, it, should we uh, be, get involved in that. Um, so this is a recap of my observations. I won't go over those again. My conclusion, uh, I did try and deconvolve the impact of COVID-19 on the race to exascale. I, didn't, I wasn't really able to. Despite widespread reports of global supply chain issues, I did not find any indications that COVID-19 impacted progress on delivering COTS at exascale. But it's been an interesting journey all the same. Thank you. <laughs>